So go ahead and join me and give a big round of applause to welcome Kasi um, for accelerating work with end-to-end -end automation. Thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I get into, I will directly get into the session. Are you tired of the manual and time-consuming tasks that reduce your productivity and hinder business growth? If yes, imagine a world where the workflow is seamless, the processes are streamlined, and the productivity shows. Now, picture yourself at the forefront of this transformative journey. Today, I will reveal the secret to accelerating the work with end-to-end -end automation. So fasten your seat belt, get ready to unleash the power of automation that revolutionize your work and <coughs> that propel you to the new heights of success. Before that, I will give a small introduction about my company and about me. Marshall McLennan is world's leading professional service firm in the area of risk, strategy, and people. More than 85,000 colleagues work across 130 countries. <clears throat> uh, we generated revenue more than $20 billion. We help private and public sector through four major leading uh, businesses like Marsh, Mercer, Oliver Weyman, and Guy Carpenter. The next is about me. I have more than 25 years of IT industry experience. I work for different firms in across different countries like Singapore, Malaysia, India, Germany, and finally, I landed in US. And I'm an expertise, I'm a technology expert in middleware, AWS, Docker, Kubernetes, and DevOps and automation. And in 2007, I started my career in Marshall as a middleware engineer. And let me get on to the real session. Looking back, four to five years back, we used to use a declarative pipeline and we used to perform the manual deployment. So if you want to deploy any application, that will take minimum five to 10 days in the legacy model to take into productions. Okay, and also we had a huge dependency against the, the operation teams to perform any deployment or any support during the weekdays or on the weekends or in the holiday season, especially on the holiday season, plus on the weekends, we get a limited resources. When the number of deployment increases, we get a pushback from the operation teams. Now let me go in detail how we used to work four to five years back. On Monday, Monday morning, our build master receives the complete list of application needs to be get deployed. He prepare the artifacts and he push the into the source central uh, repository, and he prepares and he makes the build and he sends the de deployment request or create the request to the operation team, and he sends it to the operation team. The Tuesday morning, the support team or the operation teams pick up the ticket and they perform the deployment into the, the lower region, okay? Once they deployed, they send the node to the uh, QA testing team for the testing purpose. The Wednesday, once the QA testing is completely signed off and it's ready, and the build master receives the sign off or the information, and he raises the ticket for the non-prod region. On Thursday morning, again, the routine, the operation teams will perform the deployment into the non-prod region and the performance uh, region, and the, some test which some application needs the performance test, which undergoes that one. Once it's the sign off is provided on Thursday, the application will be ready for the Friday. The Friday, the, build, the support team prepares the list of application which got signed off and which went through the, all the change management process. Okay, once it is done, they will perform the deployment into the production on the Friday night. If the business critical application, they provide the business, provide the sign off on the Friday, or sometimes if it is a non-critical application, they provide sign off on Saturday and before the business starts on Monday. That's how we used to work four to five years back. Now, what are the challenges with the legacy deployment process? First, we have a dependency upon the other team. As I said that previously, we have a dependency upon the other team. When you want to perform a deployment on the holiday season, you need to depend upon the support team. When there is a, when there is a more deployment, number of deployment ticket raises, we get a pushback. Then we need to hold off the release or your deployment cycle for that week. And also, 
you need to support mandatory for in our company. It is a mandatory to join our release meeting and the change meeting. So weekly twice, you have to spend an hour, uh, two hours with them, one hour on each topic. Okay, the release meeting, we discuss about what are the changes which is getting moved into this release cycle. And the next one is the change management and what is the impact. We once the sign off is done, everything is done. We talk about the impact analysis, what is the impact because of this change and who is getting impacted, what is the level of the impact. So everybody has to join this meeting to discuss globally across the team. Next, the reactive alert modeling. What happens is there is no automation when there is a support team makes the uh, deployment. Sometimes th they forget to create the alert. What will happen is when the server happens, it goes in a reactive model. The people will start to uh, pinpoint each other, saying that it is get delayed. Why the triage is getting delayed? Sometimes it may take a time to identify it, the the ownership of the application, and then they find it later. They found that there is no alert is configured. Okay, I will cover how we how we covered it in the automation. Okay. Then it become a labor intensive. The last one is the labor intensive. When there is a new project is getting started, for example, and which needs a couple of JVMs or a couple of containers which needs to be created, then the, the question arises, there is no capacity. Capacity question arises, okay? So in that mode, we need to go and provision a VMware, VM, VM. then it takes seven to 10 days, and then we need to get installed the, the softwares like a uh, IBM, WebSphere, or Tomcat, or JBoss. It takes uh, another five to 10 days across all the region. And then we have that checklist to make sure that the team is verified and provided the sign off. Until that, you cannot perform any deployment. And moreover that, even everything is signed off, and then still it has to align with your uh, deployment cycle, like a change management process on the release cycle. It has to completely align with that process. Okay, so minimum it takes two to three months for an application to reach into production with this, the whole legacy model. Okay, the next, we'll talk about how we achieved, how we improved it, okay. The goal is, we started, we want to deploy our application that should be a data center agnostic. That means we don't want to keep any dependence against any data center or any cloud provider. Okay, the next question arises: how we can achieve this one. The easiest way is, to achieve this one is containerizing the application. That is only the easiest way. The next, we have around 400 to 500 applications running globally. In the, how we can migrate this application as fast, correct? If you go in the legacy model, you know that it is going to take minimum two months, which has to get into the cycle and it get reach the production, which is not possible to migrate this volume of work. So we decided that we, the only the option is to automate this deployment, then only we can achieve it in a shorter period of time. Then we started our uh, automating our deployment and then automated slowly, we automated the uh, testing and the uh, scanning of our applications. And finally we support, end up in the parallel project supports and, and many features in our pipelines. This was totally achieved by a program called modernization program internally. And then it went through we, call, we went into three phases, okay? One first phase, we standardize our, all of our tool sets, like uh, build, or, or you can say source central, or, or your repository, or the build process. Everything got streamlined. For example, the, in Java, we used to do, some team used to do Ant, some people used to do Maven, some people used to do the uh, Gradle, correct? So we standardized that one to make it to one common one. And the, like that, we the ticketing system, each and every team has their own ticketing system process has been followed. This all got streamlined in the phase one. In the phase two, we containerized all our application and we, we, we made the capability to run all our application as a Docker-based applications. And then <coughs> we built this uh, simple CID CD process to perform the deployment for this, the migration. In the third phase, as a, as a part of improvement and the third phase, we moved all our application into the Kubernetes for much better orchestration. And then we improved our uh, the pipeline. We enabled the capability for the to perform the deployment at any point of time, which increased the productivity for the developers. Not only for the migration, which is in the, the new, new application also. The next step is we are planning to enable the end-to-end -end testing in our pipeline. Okay, that is our goal. And then we want to collect more metrics for the 
the pipeline, like where the build got failed and what is the reason we want to standardize that one. That is our next goal. The key feature about the automation, and we have many key features in our pipeline, okay? So it will take a long time to discuss. So I'll talk about only three key features, which is very important, which I felt in our pipeline is very important. Okay, let me go through one by one. The anytime production deployment and quality gates in the pipeline and the progressive deployment, which our pipeline completely supports these three key features, which is very important. And anytime production deployment, as a part of the shift towards the left, we want to make our developers to perform the deployment from dev to production. So, and also we want to make sure that our developers can perform the deployment at any point of time during the daytime or in the weekdays or any time. There is no restriction as long as they follow the, make sure that they have all the process and auditing controls are in place. Make sure that they have the attachments are attached in the process flow. And say, third, they completely we remove the dependency against the support team and then uh, change management team or the release team. Okay, any point of time that the developer can perform the deployment into their uh, respective region, wherever they want to. Next is the challenge. What is the challenge we faced when we roll out this feature into in our pipeline? Okay, we got a lot of, it's a cultural change. When you say shift towards the left, the people are used in the legacy model. We got a lot of pushback from the, the developers saying that why we need to perform the deployment in the production or non-prod region, why we need to own all this process, okay? So we conducted solution is, we conducted a lot of demos and we, we educate them the benefits of using the anytime deployment, what are the key features, why they need to adopt it. The next is the lesson learned. Uh, it's better what we learned from this last three, four years. I want to share it with you. Make sure that you socialize with your development team more frequently and make sure that they are aware of all your, aware of all your, the features available in your pipeline. And make sure that you are doing a phased approach, doing a MVP with the development team, and publish the pipeline features on the roadmap periodically in your DevOps channel or in an email distribution list. And if, moreover, they say if there is a communication lag with the development team or your developers, then the adoption to the pipeline will be very less. They might be using only the basic features of your pipeline for the deployment. For example, if you introduce so many features like a progressive deployment and other things, they won't take it. Our pipeline is completely built on uh, configuration-driven deployment. Uh, we, I can say categorize into three categories. One is deployment properties, application properties, and environment-specific properties. Okay, this entire pipeline is built to support more than uh, 500, 500 applications. This has been used the same pipeline, the single pipeline is written, and it is supports multiple flavors like Java, Node, PHP, .NET Core, and other applications. And as I said that we mainly, then the deployment properties, we specify what kind of cluster, where it has to go, because we have uh, more than around 80 clusters running across the globe. The any developers can perform any deployment across any clusters, okay? So they have to specify which cluster they where they want to perform it. And application properties like SDK version, for example, if it is a Java, what kind of Java version they want to perform it, okay? But they can select the pick and choose their JDK version. And the next thing is the environment property files where the developer processes this information. That one like a heap size and other things where which the developer can control by themselves. Okay, this is the, uh, the snippet of our property file where the developer specify all these informations. The next is, the, uh, I'll show the sample ticket. Next, let me go and play a little bit small video which talk about our, uh, basically, we use the ticketing system as an orchestration tool to promote our code. Once the developer cut the release cut, we make sure that the release, is, the release branch is getting deployed. And we control all our deployment through the proper promotions with the approval process, approval process, for because we need to follow which is needed for our audit. 
Okay, we clearly specify which development, which the group can approve for which region, everything is captured, which is the people who are in the part of this group can perform it and we capture the fixed version. What are the, the changes are getting along with this release. And moreover, and as I said that we are in a uh, configuration driven deployment, the, the developer will specify all the configuration detail and other information, what kind of deployment they want to perform it. And we perform the scanning, and I, which I cannot open it here because which has the vulnerability report, which will get rejected or approved based on the report, which is automated, 100% automated. For the audit purpose, we capture the complete detail about who performed this entire operation, which will be captured across the, all the regions. And when it's getting into production, we automatically create the change order ticket for the productions. When you go to the, when it's automatically creates the ticket, we make sure that who requested this, who approved it or who requested in the non -pro, in the production region, and we capture the complete detail, which ticket issue, the issue ticket has been used to perform the complete deployment, and what are the, uh, the changes has been went inside these changes. If you want to backtrack, you can go back to that, uh, the previous the issue ticket number, and you can backtrack it, what are the vulnerability has been addressed, what are the features I went through in this ticket. Next is, I'll show you a small. It's not playing. Okay, this is our statistics. After we move to the anytime deployment, you can see in the month of June to July, we performed more than 2,300 deployments across all the region. The previously, which is not possible because of the, the labor intensive labor the resource or whatever you can see. Okay, you can see which deployment got deployed, where it got deployed. We have created the dashboard, how many, what are the types of products has been deployed, and how many deployment happened in the blue-green in the last month in the production by the business. And it will tell you how, what is the mean time, how long it takes to perform the deployment, each and every region, and each and, by each and every application, we can get this information. This kind of information is only it is easy to achieve only by means of automation. If you're doing a manual deployment, the people will miss it, the parameters or the tagging or anything, which is not possible to get all the details. The next. Next, next topic is the quality gates in our pipeline. Okay, we introduced uh, as I said, that is one of the key features. Okay, the quality gates are essential part of the modern application development practice. It is used as a checklist or a gate at every stage of an SDLC. Because nowadays, the compromise and uh, the hacking is happening more. So we want to make sure that your, the code is scanned properly with all the bells and whistles before it get moved into the development region. Even in, in our company, you cannot perform deployment into the development region without fixing all your vulnerability and the fixer, the security fixes, which is not, we are not allowing anybody to perform deployment even into the development region. The challenges, again, there was a, when we introduced this feature into our pipeline, a lot of pushback from the development team saying that even they cannot able to perform their deployment into the development region. So we say the solution is, one thing is to conduct more demos and explain them the benefits, why they need to perform it. And the next is the lesson learned as a, why we used to happen this one is, mainly we define the base image. The base image, most of the time we get the vulnerability, we go in a reactive model. Okay, when the, whenever there is an issue in the base image, so the team will start to fix the base image. So there will, excuse me, there will not be any productivity for, for to fix ours until we roll out the new images. So that become a big, Problem. So we defined the life cycle of the base image. So we started to update every day. So that become much easier for the, the developers. So the, it, the, it doesn't become a blocker. So slowly and then we educated the team why it is very important to address the vulnerability. So they also learned and then they adopted it in a period of time. The next is the progressive deployment. In our pipeline, we support uh, both Blue green and canary deployment. Uh, the, uh, our business, our product owners, our TPM can perform their 
deployment, not our developers. Okay. As I said that when we move to the higher region, each and every other develop the group, the group of different team can perform their deployment on their own because we want to leave it to the the business whenever they want to perform the deployment, either it is a Saturday or Friday, it doesn't matter for us from the application development team. So that's why we enable this feature like a canary deployment and the uh, progressive deployment in our pipeline. The challenges, again, this deployment will be done by the our TPM or the product owners who are not aware of the technical features. What is the, the blue-green deployment and what is the uh, canary deployment? So again, we conducted the lot of demos and we explained the business benefits, why they need to adopt, what, which is which suits which which one. We explained them to the, the team, what is canary, what is blue-green. So the business started to adopt it slowly. As a lesson learned, I would say that in the from the beginning, if you are moving into this model, make sure that you are talking about these features with your business and conduct more demos, make videos. And finally, we ended up in creating two minute or three minute videos. So the business can, whenever they want to use it, how to use it, so that they can go and play the video and we explain the key features because we are keep on onboarding the more and more people adopting these features. So every time we cannot conduct the demos and session for each and every team. So we ended up in creating the more videos. So my advice is for you to, from the day one, whenever you are creating a new features or rolling out a new feature, create a small video and publish it in your, your uh, repository or your SharePoint or whatever. And as I said that our most of our deployments are the progressive deployment, uh, sorry, configuration driven. The developer will decide what kind of deployment they want to perform. They will pass that parameter. That parameter will be carried for, for by, from the development to production region. This is the simple, uh, you can see that what is the deployment process. If it is normal, it will do the rollout up update. If it is a blue-green, it performs the blue-green deployment. And if it is a canary, it performs the canary deployment. Let me play a small video of the demo, how the business can perform the uh, canary deployment in production. Assume that the application is parked into the, parked in the production area. Now the ones they approve the production, approved the PO. Sorry. So they play this. It will have the in, the in the issue ticket. It will be pop up with the with the play. So what kind of the deployment they want to perform it? Once they selected that one, it will it will perform the deployment into their respective region. Okay, the basically we have a, the, the issue the issue ticket, we have the workflow is defined, where once they approve the ticket, okay, it will be popped up with the uh, window. So you can see the developer has passed this parameter as a canary deployment, okay. Now it's going to pop, once they approve it, it is going to perform the canary deployment. It pop up with the window to ask the user to enter the percentage of request need to be forwarded. Here, if you see, if you see, now the business is going to enter the 25%, it's in a percentage. So the 25% of the request will go to the, the new deployment. The remaining 75% will go to the old deployment. Once they approve, it will happen the deployment. Once the deployment happened for your the, for this demo purpose, we capture we did a small load test in the background. Okay, so you can see the two versions are running, which has the 25% which is running, and the 75% of the request is going to the old one. And with the help of the automation, you can compare these two versions. You can see it clearly. These two versions we have tagged with the some versioning number. So you can compare your this help. You can compare your deployment, the performance with the previous version. So as a part of this automation, at any point of the time, the developer wants to compare their build across between the two different versions. They can go to their the datadog, or they can go to the compare the, between these two versions. This can this is easily achieved because of our automation. Now once it is done, now. 
again the business will get the pop up window again the business will can increase the uh, the traffic to 75% or 85% based on their need to see the error or anything so they will increase the perform they will increase the routing traffic the more now the business is increasing to 75% this is all controlled by the the uh, business owner or the product owner they perform the deployment into the, the production until it reach 100% it will go into the the percentage you can keep on increasing at any point of time if you want to roll back just feed the your percentage to zero immediately if you are not happy after moving to 95% you are not happy with the you are not happy with the the new version just the during the next cycle go and increase the if you want to go on the routing factor to zero then it automatically all your request go to the uh, old one this is our the next one we have the blue green again the there is no video just i want to show the sample ticket where the business has adopted uh, the real time the business has adopted the parameter as a blue green then it will perform the blue green deployment in the production so you can see this is the this is you can see how many blue green deployment happened the during the last month this many blue green deployment has been happened in the production this is the sample ticket and the looking forward we are planning to automate more products in our pipeline not only the web technology and other things like a db and we want to integrate our end to end testing uh, in our pipeline and then recap always take a phased approach don't try to roll out a bigger one define the base image policy from the day one as a lesson learned as i said that we went in a reactive mode when there was a vulnerability we started to fix the developers started to lose their time the entire company and the socialize with your pipeline features periodically and the roadmap with your development team periodically the conduct more demos and working session to make sure that your development team understands the pipeline features which you introduce it and to make sure that the, they are understanding the vulnerability necessity to address the vulnerability why it is needed because the nowadays there are more compromise and hacking are happening so to educate the team make sure that they are addressing asking ask them to install more plugins in their ide to to get like a sonar cube plugin or open source vulnerability to identify on the open source library they can identify in the earlier stage before they get into production this all we learned on a reactive phase how we can improve the efficiency of the developer the last one is sorry the last one is be a, make sure that your your pipeline is a enabler not a blocker okay that is very important to make sure that if you introduce anything new you should remove the dependency you make sure that there is no dependency on the pipeline they have to the, all the developers has to work independently any features you roll out doesn't matter is a small or big it doesn't matter make sure that it is 100% there is no dependency on anybody that is the very important because otherwise whatever you did the automation it will become a blocker on the single feature okay next i want to thank my leadership who helped me to to achieve this point here i want to my leadership and my team who helped me a lot throughout my journey these are the people who helped me throughout my journey thank you thanks for attending this session i'll open the floor to q and a all right folks any thank questions thank you so much uh, for the the warm round of applause if you have questions i will run this mic to you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, it, it looked like the canary analysis uh, is, is manual today. I am curious uh, what your thoughts are on uh, a journey towards automating that part of the process. Uh, so that way, um, 
either there's automatic rollback to zero based on some leading indicators of issues, uh, or it automatically uh, rolls forward. Uh, second question is, uh, the company I work for, it, it was difficult to get folks to adopt those Canary deployments. And I'm curious how long it took uh, for your business to, to go through that uh, Canary deployment uh, journey and, and what sort of adoption you have uh, for that today. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Uh, correct me if my understanding is correct. First, you are saying the how you can automate the Canary deployment instead of increasing the percentage, correct? First, I'll let me answer that question. You can automate it. The question, the challenge is here, it is done by the business. One, the, the TPM, they are not, they want to understand that, they want to make sure that there is no impact to the business. Okay, the first thing. So there is no error and there is no issues are happening, 100%. Then they want to increase the, the percentage slowly. Okay, this is mainly adapted for the, uh, the features like when it's a, uh, what is a internet based application, especially for the API based call. Okay, we are slowly rolling out these features. Maybe the down the line, there might be a requirement we need to automate this one to move it automatically based on the number of errors or there is no error for a period of time, then it can we can push it out. Because it's like a, as long as you have enabled the webhook with the issue ticket, as long as you read the locks and enable the webhook, you can call the REST API to make these changes. We can do it. It's doable. The second question is, correct me if I'm wrong, there again, how you can educate the business to, how you educate more people to adopt this culture, correct? I think, the it, first was, uh, I think it was specifically how long how long? take you? Okay, it is a, it took almost one and a half years approximately. Okay, initially there was a lot of, as I said, a lot of pushback, okay. So we initially we went with the people who are ready to adopt in our company. We opened the floor to saying that whoever is interested, just we said that we will support them 100% if there is any issue in the pipeline. And we, we step up also one step more, saying that we can call us anytime to provide if there is any issue in the pipeline. We make sure that they are very comfortable by using that pipeline. So once they started to use it, automatically the people understand that benefits how many times they are performing the deployment, how it is got elevated, that human dependency other process, automatically people started to step up. And then we conducted more demos. When the people who are interested, we reach out to a lot of the program managers and the directors saying that we want to roll out and then we spend the time with them to by doing more demos. That's why I said, create videos with the proper small, small pieces that will be very helpful in the beginning itself. Because we later, after one and a half years, we understood that we need to create videos. All right, we've got one over here. I hope here. I answered your question. Thank you. Got one, one more on this side of the room. Hello. Um, so I have a question. It seems like uh, there was a certain level of maturity that your uh, team was already working towards. Um, and I think maturity is a really interesting subject when it comes to security because it seems like the more mature you get, the more obsessed you become with automating things. And that seems to be somewhat of a vicious cycle. Um, if you had to take, and obviously you presented a lot of information, if there was one key piece of advice you would have for a team that's still developing and working towards a certain level of maturity, what would it be? Yes, this is very important. As I said, when you are rolling out these features, like a sec any security product, which is going to block your deployment, becoming a blocker. So you need to make sure that you are educating them and make sure that they understand the what is the necessity, why they need to block it, correct? And also it's a policy in our company. It become a policy because they don't want to, because why the reason is we, 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 we run our clusters in the different vendors like AWS, Azure and other things, correct? Even the, the development region, which is exposed to the other, other internet, correct? We don't want to deploy any vulnerable code into the the development region, correct? That's the reason we enforce the developer to address any vulnerability. So that's the reason, as, as I said, you need to educate the team to in, introduce more and more plugins. What are the earliest way to find the vulnerability in the earliest stage? For example, SonarCube, if the code quality 
you can install a plugin in your IDE, you can advise the developer, they can get the report when they are developing it. And also, you can install, there is an open source library reduction, you can install that plugin, and the developer can address when they are using any open source library, that will tell whether it's a vulnerable or not, it will advise which latest version to take it and use it. So you don't have to go and hit the roadblock and address the issue. So as I said, that we all learned after a period of time, okay? So that's my advice to adopt this one from the, the day one. Did I answer your question or? Okay, thank you.